Today's episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform called Squarespace 7, and it has a completely redesigned interface, integrates with Getty Images and Google Apps, has 15 new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace with a free trial at squarespace.com. Enter offer code VERBAL at checkout for 10% off. That's Squarespace. Start here, go anywhere. Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. Ty Hildebrand here, Dan Rubenstein, all the way over there. No, he's not in Arizona. He is back. No. In beautiful New York City, it is signing day. You're joined by Bud Elliott, Dan. Yeah. How does the other half live? You are too. You are also joined by Bud Elliott. Bud is fantastic. Today is today is his prom. Yeah. Know, was that what we would consider this? What is, this is like the the culmination of a lot of work. Yeah. No. It, it's it's our Super Bowl. It, it's kind of the uh, the day. And then tomorrow is the day I hopefully forget everything I learned about these kids and unfriend them all on Facebook and stop getting tagged and. Uh, Jordan shoe spam and, and other nonsense. And uh. <laughs> so you said something very interesting there. You unfriend them all on Facebook. What is the process like for you as a recruiting analyst to friend these kids in the first place? Because if you read the Twitter feed that Dan's had going, we're not fans of tweeting or at all being involved with some of the lives of these 17 or 18 year olds. But because of what you do, you almost have to. How does that like resonate with your soul? You know, it, it's actually not not that easy sometimes to find them, and, and I'm very thankful that most kids are now are using either Twitter or Instagram, but some still use Facebook. And the the difficult thing uh, is is like when a kid has a, a a very unique nickname that I am not aware of, like uh, I don't know Kevin Swagzilla Jenkins or something like that, and I have to like randomly you know you can't guess at something like that, so you have to try and find maybe his high school coach on Facebook and figure out okay is he in his friends list something like that. And basically just say, Hey, with SB nation, I, I want to talk to you about an interview for whatever schools you're liking or any upcoming visits. And, and most of them are pretty cool with it. A lot of them actually don't want to talk on the phone. They just prefer to text, uh, which is a little annoying to conduct an interview over text message, but uh, you, you got to go to them where, 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 the, where the kids are. And for the most part now they're on Twitter and, and increasingly Instagram. We are joined uh, by Bud Elliott, as Dan mentioned. You can find him over at TomahawkNation.com and, of course, at SBNation.com. It is also my understanding that uh, since it has been a long day for you two gentlemen, we're going to get into that momentarily, but we all have uh, a bottle of beer in front of us, do we not? What what do you guys got going on over there? Uh, I've got a Singha. It's my my Thai go-to for you, Thai. Very nice. And I'm uh, sipping on a Brooklyn lager. It's a... Pre-prohibition style and uh, was in the Fox Media kitchen. So okay, I'm going with a Blue Moon Mountain Abbey Ale over here, and it's got on the label, uh, it's like a log cabin with mm-hmm. a snow scene in the background. Dan, like a winter wonderland, very appropriate. You know, something like that. So all right, what you know, I don't like to ask the talk about question, but talk about your day. What exactly talk about recruiting? What what exactly happened over there? Two shows. Yeah. All day, um, all night. What What's the deal? Yeah, let's get right to it. So basically, work wise, we did a live show for the ACC and the SEC. Obviously, their commitments are happening earlier on in the day in the southeast. Uh, and then we did a show in the evening time, Pacific time around two in the afternoon. So I guess five in the east. Uh, Pac-12, Big 12, Big 10, running down all of the big classes, all of the big commitments. There were actually something like 43, four and five star commitments today, which is more than usual. So a lot of corralling cats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, it was an active day. There weren't like a number of huge shockers as per my understanding. Um, schools that have traditionally done well on the recruiting trail finished very strong for the most part. And a couple of schools established themselves once again as a, a recent power. Clemson is the one of the, that, that stands out. They've recruited really well recently, um, but we reviewed everything. We talked to SB nation experts and, Honestly, the the story to me of the day was just how well the L.A. schools closed, which yeah. is not a huge shock. But even still, 
very impressive. Alabama, of course, recruited another home run class. Auburn finished very strong with Byron Cowart, who a lot of people has have as the number one recruit in the country, the defensive end from just outside of Tampa. Um, Georgia had an eventful day. Ohio State had a relatively eventful day, but still finished strong as expected. Not not really because of their recruiting momentum after the national championship, just because Urban Meyer is that good of a recruiter. Um, outside of that, you know, Harbaugh had his limited time at Michigan. Tennessee had an outstanding class, another great year for Butch Davis in Knoxville, but nothing on the level of like Bryce Brown deciding to delay or Terrell Pryor delaying or any of like the mat. Like there was some fax machine madness, but none on the level of like Alex Collins is now driving away from his family in search of a fax machine and or Cyrus Guanjo announced for Auburn and that's not where he's going to go. So nothing on that level. It was just sort of expected surprises, if any. All right. Well, this again is the solid verbal. You can find us on Facebook, on FanCred, and of course on Twitter. If you head on out to solidverbal.com slash verbies, you can vote on our Verbi Awards. Dan, we have to talk about this. We'll figure out when exactly we're going to give out our imaginary awards. But in the meantime, if you are listening and if you are interested in voting on the uh, Verbi Awards, please do head on out one more time to solidverbal.com slash Verbi. So here's the perspective that I'm coming at all this from. Mm -hmm. I was at the office all day. Oh, so was I. I was at the office all day, completely disconnected from all this. Why don't we do this? Let's just go conference by conference. What are just like the big headline stories you need to know? We have some questions on Facebook. Let's go through the conferences, the major conferences. Let's go through general recruiting Q and a, let's just, let's hammer this show out. Like it is a, a chicken breast about to be parmesan. <laughs> and on that note, let's start with the SEC. Yes. A lot of Chick-fil-A's down there in SEC country. This is true. Chick-fil-A is good, but I feel like you always crave it on a Sunday when you're when you're really hungover <laughs> and it's just not available. And they're closed, and right? Right, exactly. So, And, and that's, that's the right, of course, but it, I feel like it's also my right to be really hungry for some fried chicken on a Sunday when I have a hangover. And their breakfast is also really good, which makes it even more infuriating mm. that Chick-fil-A is not open on, on a uh, on Sundays. I, I think Cane's is pretty good, to be honest. They, Cane's they is have, really good. They have great breakfast burritos at Chick-fil-A. But really? We, breakfast burritos, really? Yeah, they have good uh, good breakfast burritos over there. I will say the Whataburger, and this is really probably exceptionally unhealthy, the Whataburger uh, honey butter chicken biscuit. I have had that. Is really, really good. Also, shout out to the security guard in the Midtown Tallahassee location of the Whataburger, who was actually strapped, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm like, wow, you're carrying a gun and you're a Whataburger security guard. That's pretty awesome. Um that was random. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no. I, Sorry, you may want to cut that out. But shout out you to can that also guy. Leave no, it no, if you no. Want. That's that's the color. I, I, I was I was there one night and I was like, wow, that is, uh, huh? Okay. So SEC, right? If yes. I saw correctly, something like eleven of the top twenty-two schools were SEC schools. Makes it's, sense. It's no surprise that the SEC did well again on the recruiting trail. Alabama, by most counts, is the national champion yet again. When it comes to recruiting, what was the main takeaway for SEC? Was it Tennessee's rise? Was it Auburn's rise sort of late in the game? Was it Alabama's continued dominance? What stuck out for you guys? So I'll, I'll speak to it from a non-expert perspective, but somebody who's been paying attention to it for a little while now. Yeah, Tennessee is probably the big story just in terms of restocking their talent level to a degree that they should be able to compete for the East sooner rather than later. Alabama, it's, it's another ho-hum. Every guy's a blue chipper and they got pretty much everybody they wanted, uh, or at least close to everybody that they wanted. Calvin Ridley, they lose a lot of receivers, obviously in Tuscaloosa, Calvin Ridley is physically prepared to come in and succeed right away. Uh, Kendall Sheffield, Minka Fitzpatrick are two defensive backs. If, if there was an area where Alabama did struggle, their defensive backs last year, able to be exploited by Ohio State um, in, in the biggest of games. So those two guys come in to sort of help out last year's big commits and Marlon Humphrey and Tony Brown. Um, but it's it's sort of like to be expected. They pulled a, a great quarterback from Southern California and Blake Barnett, who was uh, committed to Notre Dame, as you know, for quite a bit of time. And then, yeah, Tennessee was big. Auburn closing on Byron Cowart, who was who had a very good relationship with Will Muschamp. He cowered at a defensive end from the Tampa area. Will Muschamp, obviously the new, I sing obviously a lot. He is clearly, he is, yes, the defensive coordinator for the Auburn Tigers. So he follows him to the Plains. Uh, outside of that, 
there there was, you know, Ole Miss got a number of really good dudes. Florida actually closed especially well, considering that they have a new head coach in McIlwain with uh, Martez Ivy, a top, top offensive tackle, and CeCe Jefferson, a very good defensive end. So the string of really good defensive linemen at Florida appears to be continuing. Um, we talked about this earlier on the show, Ty. I know this is fun for you to watch, is that transition from sort of spread to pro style or pro style to spread and how guys are recruited and are they recruiting the right types of players? Sure. And it looks like Florida is doing a pretty good job. It looks like they are going to be stocked pretty well for a transition away from perhaps a more mobile type system that they were running at times with Treon Harris with, uh, with Jeff Driscoll. So that'll be interesting to see how they transition. But um, I wouldn't say anything enormous. Georgia had a nice day. Um, who Auburn got a great running back in Jovan Robinson. Yeah, uh, Jovan Robinson, who was initially committed to Auburn uh, two years ago, and then it was found out that uh, apparently through no fault of his own or of his own and without knowledge, uh, some guidance counselor or something had actually changed his transcript uh, when oh he God. was in high school. So he had to go to junior college, and he really tore it up at Georgia Military School. Uh, about 220 pounds, a, a real physical presence that, that, that Trey Mason gave them last year, and they really or the, you know two years ago, and they didn't really have this year. This year they're a little more, a little more uh, boomer bust, if you will, with, right. with kind of the explosive guys. This should the, the, Robinson will give them the back. Most likely, you can stay ahead of the chains and, and keep them in good down and distance and work on that play action game. Yep. And uh, outside of that, in the SEC West, it was actually a really nice, albeit a weird, ending to Texas A&M's class. They get perhaps the most dynamic quarterback in the class, and Kyler Murray, albeit he's about five ten. Yeah, maybe. Um, but he he dominated the highest level of competition in Texas, so he's he's going to be a great quarterback uh eventually after kyle allen departs uh, i'm i'm handing bud my uh he's on to beer number two so oh, okay we want it we want to keep it lubricated um but uh yeah Daylon mack who was initially committed to texas a&m a huge defensive tackle should shore up and give john chavis a huge piece as he takes over that defense uh christian kirk a speedy receiver from arizona let me let me ask a question here please kyler murray yes but is the size a uh a complication is that something that worries you as a recruiting analyst? Yeah, I, I, well, I think because mobility is such a big part of his game, you, you do worry. Okay, the, the guy this mobile is he going to take these shots and, and and bounce back? Is it going to affect me if, if he gets hit? The SEC it obviously produces probably better defenses than any, any other conference in the country a, a, as an entire entity. And um, you know, it, it was a question for for Johnny Manziel, and, and he always sort of uh, ended up not taking the the, the full on kill shot, if you will. We'll have to see what Murray does, but I, I think it's a concern. He's very slight of build, uh, but he, he's extremely natural as a runner and 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 really has a great feel for the passing game as well. So it's the, the talents there. I think if you're a you have to wonder how much you want him running. Yeah. The other school that jumps out at me, Mississippi State seems to have done pretty well. And it's been a while since I think we could confidently look at Mississippi State and say, all right, this program's probably headed in the right direction. But with what we saw from Dak Prescott this year and how that program seemed to take a step forward. Dan Mullen would seemingly be doing a pretty good job at Mississippi State. Did this class surprise either of you at all? You know, I, I think he did a really nice job uh, of keeping some of the top talent in Mississippi home. Uh, they got Jamal Peters, who's a really nice uh, safety slash linebacker type. They ended up with Leo Lewis. Both of those guys are, are among the, the top, top three or top four players at their position in the entire country. Mississippi State under Dan Mullen has always done a nice job of scouting sort of some of the underdeveloped guys. And, and granted, you know, they, they've not won the SEC. They've not played for an SEC title, but they, they've done very well relative to their recruiting rankings. Uh, just pulling it up here over the last couple of years, about one in six of their guys had been rated as, as blue chips. This year, about one in three. Okay. Uh, so they, they about doubled their ratio of elite level prospects while, while still staying true to their formula of really trying to scout the JUCOs in, in Mississippi and, and try to scout the uh, – some of the high schools, Mississippi, and that's an area they don't play a lot of seven on seven ball in Mississippi. Those kids are not necessarily the, the most developed. They're not the most exposed. So there is some opportunity there for some underdeveloped prospects to kind of slide under the radar. And if you're an old Miss or Mississippi State, you have the, the most contact with those kids because of your camps and because of your local contacts. You can kind of find more hidden gems in Mississippi than maybe some other schools do. Of course, Bama, Auburn and LSU have traditionally also done a pretty good job of that because they're border states. Seven on sevens have become increasingly more popular. As someone who studies this, what do you get the most out of when you're trying to evaluate? Uh, if you're a good receiver, you should dominate seven on seven because you really can't get jammed that much and, and, and you can't get grabbed all that much. So if you're a, a top receiver, 
I want to see you smoking defensive backs in seven on seven. And if you're a, a good defensive back, I, I want to see you, you know, holding your own. I want to see uh, your change of direction skills. I, I want to see you compete for the ball. You know, do you get up to knock passes away? Quarterbacks, again, you're not being rushed. If you struggle in seven on seven, that's probably an indication that it, you may have some struggles uh, yeah. throwing with anticipation, throwing in a rhythm, uh, hitting a guy in stride, being accurate. And of course, when you look at this stuff, you don't want to put too much emphasis on seven on seven. And you need to keep in mind some of these teams, particularly in the metro areas, are able to practice a lot more often than some of these teams from the rural areas. And the rural teams, it really shows when you watch them in these national tournaments, uh, they just don't get to practice as much. So they don't have that that cohesion and the fluidity. So I think when you watch this kind of stuff, uh, you have to keep that in mind and, and maybe not make concrete judgments, if you will, based on that. But, but there's some things you can pick up from it. And, and I think seven on seven does help guys to develop over the summer. Uh, particularly the skill positions and and quarterback somewhat. I've got one more question in the SEC, and then we'll move on to a different conference. Uh, Tennessee did quite well, Dan, as as you mentioned earlier, Khalil, Khalil McKenzie, Kyle Phillips, Shai Tuttle. These guys are going to help bolster that defensive line. But then, of course, you look and see what Alabama did, and it's no secret, again, a stellar class. They bring in Blake Barnett. They've got a ton of other weapons that come in with this class. How wide is the gap between Alabama and and number two nationally, perhaps number two just in the SEC? Uh, nationally, not that wide. USC really cleaned up, especially on defense. Within the SEC, you know, perhaps not as wide as, as it's been in recent years. I think Bama still has the best class, probably. They're, they're just, you know, by a hair over USC in the uh, the 247 composite rankings, which which take the, uh, the average of, of all, all the four major services out there. But I mean, the difference between Bama and Tennessee is not that great. I, I think Bama signed, what, 20 blue chip type prospects. Tennessee signed 16. Now, the difference is Bama got six five stars and Tennessee had one. Uh, but you know, the, the, the pack is coming back a little a little bit for Alabama. Is Alabama still in the lead, but it's not quite the gap as we've seen in some previous years. All right. Um, let's move to the ACC just because that feels like a transitionary conference in terms of our conversation here tonight, just because it does appear very clearly that Florida state and Clemson are the class of the conference, at least as it looks on the recruiting trail and uh, amassing talent, Georgia tech, obviously a tremendous year on the field, but they are recruiting in a different way. Florida state and Clemson going after a lot of the same athletes, Florida state, perhaps not making the big signing day splash that they have in previous years, but they walk away with a really good class, perhaps the most talented safety in the country, if not this year in recent years. Um, and then Clemson, of course, nothing big splashy like they have in previous years, but great offensive and defensive line talent, which is actually huge with what they're losing this year. Um, and, you know, some of the some of the names, especially at Clemson and the big thing with Clemson and, and Bud can speak more to this is how important it is to enroll early. If you are looking to get true freshmen on campus in a rotation role in a starting role with everything Clemson has lost on defense. But the continuity appears to be strong at the top of the ACC. And if there was a whiff, it looks like Miami. The, the gap is going to be. Like between, I think, you know, North Carolina and Virginia Tech got a couple of really interesting guys and Virginia Tech, I think it's, it's Tim Settle is the, is the defensive tackle that Virginia Tech ended up with. He's as talented as any defensive tackle as there is in the country. But um, the, it, the gap is widening between Florida State and Clemson, and it's pretty much become a de facto ACC or at least ACC divisional championship game when those two play. Yeah, I really echo what Dan said there. It's, it's Florida State Clemson 1A, 1B this year in recruiting huge gap down in North Carolina. I mean, uh, Clemson and Florida State signed, what, 26 combined blue chips. I think the ACC, the everybody, oh, the other 12 teams combined might, might have, you know, combined to sign that that number. Uh, so that, that, that's really, really a large gap. What we've seen with Clemson in previous years, they've always did, done well at the skill positions. Uh, but this year, Clemson has really addressed the offensive and defensive lines, which is really, really important. And I think that's what's been holding their classes back somewhat. They weren't landing the elite offensive tackles. This year, they land two of them. They weren't necessarily landing all the, the elite defensive linemen. This year, they land a bunch of those as well. In addition to all the skill position guys, he did a great job in Tampa going down to get Deion Kane and Ray Ray, uh, Ray, Ray McLeod, two, uh, two receivers from the Tampa area. And Florida State, you know, I, I feel like their class has a, a great amount of elite talent. They missed on, on, on some areas today on signing day. They didn't get another defensive lineman, which they wanted. They did not uh, land the second elite cornerback. I mean, and 
granted, it, it sounds a little ridiculous because they signed a guy who's a top 200 kid at corner, but they didn't sign another top, you know, 25 type corner uh, necessarily today, missing on both Mika Fitzpatrick and Biggie Marshall, who, who ended up at, at uh, Bama and USC respectively. But it's really those two classes, and then everybody they stuck with the SEC are, are as good or better than almost all the classes in the SEC. The rest of the ACC got crushed. Who are some of the names in the ACC that you would expect to hear making an impact in the next one to two years? Uh, I think on defense, you have to start with Derwin James. Uh, he's actually a safety who rivals rated higher than any safety they've ever rated. Um, and, and he's been committed to Florida State for over three years. A guy who, I, I, there's a couple of kids each year who you kind of look at and you say, okay, if you could somehow skip your senior year of high school and just be on a college team right now, you would make an impact and you would probably start or, or play a significant number of snaps. He's one of those guys. I think Christian Wilkins for Clemson is a defensive lineman with college-ready size. Clemson loses almost their entire front seven this year, or at least their starter, so he's going to be coming and asked to be played a lot of snaps early. Clemson actually had 14 early enrollees. FSU had eight. That's another thing these teams are doing now. You know, you get on campus, it's a little bit slower pace in the spring. You can make your adjustment to college at a little more tempered pace. You start to learn the scheme. You start to lift weights. You get an extra six or seven months of, of college weight training and, and college training table to get those good calories in. And uh, it, it's a big advantage. And teams are starting to place more and more emphasis on, hey, you have an offer to my school, but it's only good if you can early enroll. And they actually place priority on that. And some of these more marginal prospects, the deciding factor we're seeing is, do you have the grades and the credits to enroll and skip your final semester of high school? And that's a lot of times how these schools kind of draw the line. Okay, so if I understand it correctly, then the rich essentially get richer at Florida State. There, there's not going to be a big drop off. That that's pretty much correct. Yeah, it landed two quarterbacks, hoping that one of them can replace Jameis Winston. Uh, landed the five star corner, a five star safety, a four star running back, five star receiver. Uh, got some very underrated offensive linemen who, who they beat out some SEC teams for. It, it, and they landed the kid who, in Josh Sweat, had he not dislocated his knee and torn his ACL would have most likely been the number one overall player in the country. He's a defensive end. People think he's probably the closest thing uh, to uh, to Clowney, essentially. But who knows how he'll, back, how he'll uh, bounce back from the injury. But he was able to uh, you know, to enroll early, and, and he's rehabbing on Florida State's campus. The uh, the New York Giants surgeon apparently did the surgery, so it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they get out of him. He's not going to be ready for spring, according to Jimbo Fisher today. But, yeah, they had a really nice class. And, and Auburn – or excuse me, not Auburn, uh, Clemson, uh, which is essentially Auburn with a lake – um, <laughs> they, had another, they had a nice day too. Auburn with a lake. Did I hear that correctly? Clemson fans are going to love me for that. That was great. All right. Today's show brought to you in part by Squarespace. Daniel, I don't know if you saw the Super Bowl at all. I did see the Super Bowl at all. They uh, they had some exciting news. They partnered with the dude. You know who the dude is? Of course I do. Big Lebowski. Jeff El Bridges. Dudorino. Yeah. Jeff Bridges was in Squarespace's Super Bowl ad. It wasn't a stunt. Jeff Bridges did create DreamingWithJeff.com mm -hmm. with friends old and new. It is yep. an album, apparently, of relaxing sounds, guided meditations, and stories, which, of course, you can visit at DreamingWithJeff.com. You can listen to it for free or pay for what you want to download. On top of all that, all the proceeds go to the charity group No Kid Hungry. So... The point mm -hmm. here is if that inspires you, and perhaps Always. it's the time now, go on over to squarespace.com. Start building your website. I've said it once. I'll say it again. I'm using it for the Ty Hildenbrandt Kate wedding. Oh, nice. Which is coming up in a few months. I've used Squarespace. It's a great service. You can do it now with a free trial. You don't need a credit card. Just log on and have at it. Easy to use, customizable. It'll look beautiful on any device, thanks to all their great templates. And you know I care about my templates. Right. Use it for the portfolio, for the personal site, for the wedding site, even a storefront. If it comes to that, they've got a free commerce option. If you ever need any help, they've got 24-7 support. Head on out right now to squarespace.com. Build a website and enter the code VERBAL at checkout to get 10% off and show your support for the solid verbal that's squarespace.com slash verbal squarespace start here go anywhere is the motto dan and you tell me where are we going next i was surprised when looking at the early sketches for your wedding site how many pictures you posted of yourself greased down well you I know 
I didn't think standard wedding photographers like really like went in that direction, but I understand that you're proud of your body. So I encourage it. I'm trying to go on awkwardfamilyphotos.com. Yeah. It's absolutely. my lifelong dream, Dan. Yeah. Okay. So where are we going next? Uh, we should probably go to the Pac-12 just because USC and UCLA made such waves today, locking up who we thought they were going to lock up and also locking down some guys. I guess locking up and locking down are kind of the same thing in recruiting. Um, some guys that perhaps a lot of the uh, a lot of the people following a lot of the the recruiting cycles of uh, a lot of the cycles, a lot of the, a lot of the prospects weren't necessarily expecting. So, uh, but your general overview of the Pac-12, USC, UCLA, and who else did interesting things within the Pac-12, the nation's second best conference. You know, I I think locked up is when you get a commit, and locked down is when you keep your commits. Yes. Okay. You know, is that fair? I, I mean, that I sounds so. legitimate to me. All right, that's what we're going to go with. Uh, USC and UCLA both had great closes today. They, they, they had some guys on their board. You wonder if they could get them all. And for the most part, they did. USC did it by going in-state and really dominating California. They finally had that full complement of scholarships, and they used them to full effect. Uh, Biggie Marshall, who is, is the best cornerback in the country for my money and pretty much anybody else who, who's seen everybody else this year at, at all the camps and all the combines and stuff, at Long Beach Poly, the high school that has produced more NFL players than any in, in the history of uh, of the NFL. You know, 6'1", 200, really strong, can turn and run. Uh, a guy who's going to be a, a weapon for you in the red zone because he, he can shut down the fade. He, he can really jam you. And he'll come up and tackle. Also has some return skills. But they weren't done there. That They added Rasheem Green, a five-star defensive lineman out, out of Sarah High School in, in, in Gardena, California. Um, they, they also went ahead and added John Houston, who's a four-star linebacker. And then a, a, kind of an underrated commit they, they added today was Kevin Scott, a, a dude who's a defensive tackle, good size, even better frame, and really came on a, as the year came on. I think he's rated somewhere as like the 50th best defensive tackle in the country. No way. Uh, I think this kid is a top 25 to top 30 type defensive tackle for sure. And uh, sometimes we see these guys who take a little bit longer to develop and end up getting maybe a, a bit of a depressed rating because they've not been so good since their sophomore or junior year. So that, that was good to see UC, or uh, USC pick him up. They closed, and, and they almost caught Alabama in, in the final rankings. Had, had Bama not uh, got Dalen Charlotte from uh, from Louisiana and beat out LSU for that receiver, USC would have had the number one class. That's how close it was. It was, it was really just the difference of one player today. Uh, and then uh, UCLA al already had Josh Rosen, who's a very talented uh, quarterback with a, a bit of an attitude, and, and, and he – He's very good, and, and he certainly knows it and uh, will tell others around him <laughs> about it. And, uh, and and to that, they, they added guys like Soso Jamaba, who's a very versatile running back. UCLA loves those little uh, swing-out passes that are running back, so expect him to catch about half a million of those. They may have added Roquan Smith, who's a, a nickel linebacker type, extremely athletic out of Montezuma, Georgia. The, the deal there is he apparently signed his letter of intent, but I'm not sure if he faxed it or not or, or if it's going to be official because UCLA's defensive coordinator is apparently, as of this recording, leaving for the Atlanta Falcons. So it looks like he's going to actually open his recruitment back up. Georgia was in that. So was Michigan uh, and a few other schools. So we'll see if UCLA is able to hold on to him. But they still had a good day, even if they don't get Smith. Uh, Chris Clark, who's a very talented tight end, uh, one of the five or six best tight ends in the country for my money, out of Connecticut, a, a guy with a big frame, 6'6", 245, 250-ish, will be an instant red zone target for them. And, uh, and a player with some room to develop as well down the line. So definitely somebody to watch there. UCLA, different from, from USC in that they went out of state for a lot of their guys to get it, which is cool. I mean, it, who really cares where your kids come from as long as they're good players and, and they fit in to your culture. But they did go uh, to a state pretty close to California and Nevada to get Cordell Broadus, who is, of course, the son of Snoop D O G. You mentioned Smith's recruiting, opening it back up. He's from Montezuma, Georgia. Is no one making the Montezuma's revenge joke? <laughs> you are, Ty. You Am are. I the only one in all of the world? That is the recent trip to Mexico, I, I think, really uh, really rearing its head. <laughs> That's true. I'm the only one on the internet making that joke. Okay. Josh yeah. Rosen, we talked with Brandon Huffman. I talked mm -hmm. with Brandon Huffman earlier, uh, I guess last week, when Dan was out in Arizona. I asked him about Josh Rosen. I watched the Elite 11. They painted him as a tortured genius in, <laughs> I guess, for lack of better terms. What is your read on Rosen? Is he coachable? Is he the kind of guy who's going to get under people's skin? What What is this kid's makeup? You know, I think the coachability question is, 
it, it's certainly uh, one that needs to be asked because at the 11, he did rub some people the wrong way. And I think he's a guy with a really advanced understanding of, of football for his age. He obviously has the arm to make all the throws. He's very accurate. He's pretty mobile within the pocket. But if you're a quarterback, you have to be a leader and your teammates have to, uh, if not like you, at least respect you. And I think that he may have a little bit of room to grow in the leadership department. I really don't like to bash on high school kids like that. You know, a lot of us, uh, if we were being evaluated by national folks when sure. we were in high school, probably wouldn't have liked the evaluations there. So we'll, we'll see what happens when it gets on campus. And, and sometimes we do see with really elite players is that once they get around other elite guys, they, they, they kind of tone that down a little bit because it, just the level of talent and, and the level of expectation rises around them. While we're on the topic of uh, UCLA, mm-hmm. we are contractually obligated to point out that so-so Jamobo, Jamabo, Jamabo, he officially so, so yeah. committed to UCLA by tweeting out, quote, officially committed, Asian girls everywhere, Asian UCLA, everywhere! heart, heart. Those apparently are childish Gambino lyrics. Yeah. But uh, we needed to point that out. The other thing I'll mention while we're on the subject of the Pac-12, are you guys buying the fact that Chris Warren's coin flip was legit and that is what prompted him to pick Texas over Washington or do you think it was staged? Sorry, got to wait till they turn the mic to me. No, uh, everybody thought he was going to Texas, and the same goes for uh, Arden Key, the the uh, defensive end who committed to LSU over South Carolina on Monday night. Uh, th- both those were, were pretty well known going into signing day. All right, let's go to the Big Twelve next. I have some thoughts about Oregon. Uh, oh, oh, that's right. There's another school to talk about. Go on. Yeah, one that wins the conference. Oh, uh, no, God. There- there were there were others. The Arizona schools actually both did really well. And the Pac-12 South went through the Arizona schools last year with Arizona State playing in it late. You remember Arizona State from such games as, oh, my God, Everett Colson just threw another interception. He just threw another one. Uh, and Arizona closed really well. Uh, their their talent is is not the highest, but they're, they're coached really well. And they find guys that's that fit that three, three, five on defense. They got a really good offensive tackle this year uh, to go along with an experience now experienced quarterback in a new Solomon, Nick Wilson, a very good running back. So they both did really well. Oregon basically might have the fastest offensive class in the country, which is not a surprise. Oregon has really never had trouble recruiting offensive speed and for good reason. Taj Griffin, Taj, Taj Griffin. Yeah. From, from Georgia, the all purpose back Malik Lavette from Southern California, another all purpose type slot running back. And then of course, highlighted by perhaps the most physically gifted all purpose type in Kirk Merritt, who won some sort of spark competition over the off season from Louisiana. So uh, a very nice offensive class. And then the big Canton Kamatule, who is, if, if anybody watches the national championship game, talented defensive lineman, that that'll be good. He's a five-star Hawaiian defensive lineman. He goes to Oregon and they perhaps recruited their quarterback of the future, but doesn't appear to be near future. And Travis Waller, a dual threat guy from Southern California. So overall a very good class for Oregon, but not a big signing day splash type class. They missed on a couple of big linebackers they wanted, but uh, still a very, very successful haul for Mark, Mark Helfrich and the Ducks, who, by the way, is a better recruiter than Chip Kelly was. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you had you had a certain level of apprehension about Mark Helfrich continuing yes. the success of Chip Kelly. Now we're a couple classes deep. What is your review of his of his recruiting prowess? He appears to be not as stringent in his recruiting philosophy. Chip Kelly had a thing where if you hadn't visited campus officially or unofficially, he wouldn't accept a commitment. Whereas he's sort of changed the way that they look at that. He just appears and in his hires as well, Matt Lubbock, uh, the, the wide receivers coach and, uh, or Lubick, whatever it is. And Eric Chenander, who's the outside linebackers coach are two very, they're young, relentless dudes. They're also good coaches, but, um, they are, they are staffed instead of, you know, Oregon has long been staffed by lifer type position coaches. Right. And they've gone outside of that. Helfrich did when he made his hires. And these guys have done very, very well in Southern California, Texas, Louisiana, big States for talent. So, um, a very successful year, albeit one that they, I think are still a little bit disappointed that they couldn't max out on defense a little bit better. Can we go to the big 12 now? Is Let's it safe? do that. Another, a conference beneath the pac 12. Yes. Texas was I think one of the schools, I know one of the schools that we all watched very carefully headed into this cycle. It would appear as if they did pretty well. They won the coin flip with Chris Warren, so there's something. What other assets were they able to add to this class that you think can contribute right away? You know, the, the elite 
players that Texas signed for the most part are, are generally stacked on the defensive side of the ball, which is where Texas is already really good. But at least that's going to allow Charlie Strong to, to keep Texas as a good program while well, they continue to add that offensive talent. Uh, the guy you have to look out for here, Malik Jefferson, uh, has, has the speed and quickness that you saw out of a guy like a Derek Brooks. I mean, a really phenomenally quick and, and fast uh, linebacker, 6'2", 6'3", big hitter uh, at, at times. It just the, the closing speed is nuts. It, when you use him on the blitz or when he's in zone coverage and, and he's closing on a route, a, a really special player and, and one that Charlie Strong today uh, compared to Tim Tebow in terms of of uh, when when he was at Florida and Florida landed Tebow really kind of uh, sent a message to other people in Florida that that, that Florida is going to be a serious recruiting threat, and he thinks that that Jefferson is going to have a very similar impact for Texas and, and Jefferson is certainly a popular recruit and helped to bring some guys with him uh, to Texas. They also got some help on the offensive line. Texas a little bit like Penn State this year had a really uh, up and down offensive line to, to put it kindly, so they ended up getting some junior college guys there. Uh, Adam Navarro and Adam East Mississippi to, to help out on the offensive line. And then they, they they restock linebacker, they restock corner with Holton Hill and Chris Boyd, two of the top 10 corners in, in the country. I uh, really like those guys. Charlie Strong should continue to have a really nice defense and, and the offense uh, should improve some. And, and they did get a quarterback in Kyle Loxley, who's the son, of course, of uh, Maryland offensive coordinator, Mike Loxley, yeah. and, uh, who decommitted from Florida State a couple of days ago. He'll punch a guy. <laughs> I was going to say he's got a puncher's chance. Uh, Mike, not Kai. Yes. Um, and uh, and Charlie Strong and Loxley had the relationship, of course, from being on staff both in Gainesville uh, a long time ago. What about their rival, Oklahoma? I see their name all the time atop the recruiting rankings. Picked up some big names. Ricky DeBerry was one. I know jumps out to a lot of people. What else did they add? Is there anything in this class that can help get them over the hump? Because it seems like they've hit a bit of a glass ceiling as of late. Yeah, they, they went out and they, they got some defensive backs who I think are, are possibly going to help immediately. Also, kind of an undersold uh, story this year, and, and talking to Alan Kenny, who does a lot of great Oklahoma coverage, he was saying, hey, the, the receivers this year really weren't all that good. And so going out and getting D.D. Westbrook at a, at a Blinn College in Texas is a guy who's maybe not a, a superstar, uh, but, but he's an advanced receiver who should be able to just be a dependable threat for the Sooners. Of course, they're switching to the air raid this year, throwing the football a lot more. That should help them out. Uh, and they also went international recruiting uh, uh, up to Canada to get Neville Gallimore, a guy who is one of the, the top 10 or, or 15 defensive tackle prospects in the country. Sort of raw, but I mean, six two, three and a quarter, pretty quick. Uh, you can do a lot with with, uh, with a skill set like that. Also, should be worth noting in the Big 12 that there are more teams than Texas and Oklahoma. Yeah. We, we love you, our Daily Bears. Um Jarrett Stidham is a name that you should probably know sooner rather than later. The quarterback could be as talented, if not more talented than any dual threat guy, not named Kyler Murray or even more so because he is more traditionally built uh, as somebody who can take a, a bit of a physical pounding in a major conference. He's going to Baylor. And although Seth Russell looks to be the heir apparent, certainly somebody as talented as Stidham should be able to compete right away. Uh, Braden Fahoko, a giant Hawaiian defensive tackle who might be stronger than anybody else in the country in this re recruiting cycle is somehow going to Lubbock, Texas to continue his football career, going to Texas Tech and play for Cliff Kingsbury in a defense that sorely, sorely needs somebody that has something has a, an adjective behind him, like strong on that defense. So Texas tech immediately gets better uh, along their defensive front. TCU has a very nice class that they're not going to have to depend on for a little while with so much returning there in Fort worth, West Virginia, not surprisingly did another good job of a getting speed from the state of Florida as they've done in multiple years past Oklahoma state, not a huge class, not a, not a, a big list of blue chippers, but they're another team that returns a lot. Um, and then Kansas state, none, none too surprised. They load up on three stars and there's probably going to be seven of them that are as good as anybody in the conference. So um, it's uh it's pretty much a, a year in and year out thing for, uh, for the big 12 Oklahoma, as, uh, as Bud mentioned, switching offensive schemes a little with Lincoln Riley, bring in some speed, bring in some athleticism. Of course they returned perhaps the best, if not one of the best young running backs in Samaj P Ryan. So they're surrounding him with some more speed that looks like they went after a lot of defense, a lot of beef in the middle, which should make that it was, it was a problem for Oklahoma, the back half of the season defensively. So a number of guys certainly talented enough to contribute Ricky DeBerry, an inside linebacker. They need help at linebacker though. Re they return a lot. So Oklahoma is in a good spot. And, um, the balance of power appears to be pretty similar. It still looks for, for at least the time being, at least until Texas gets a quarterback 
at least until Oklahoma can sort of figure out defense and offensive scheme, that it's a Baylor TCU conference. Baylor TCU conference. Our daily yeah. bears will like that one, Dan. Yes, indeed. Oh, excuse me. TCU Baylor. TCU Baylor. Let's go to the Big Ten. Ohio State. Yeah. Another big class for Ohio State. Penn State dominating the state mm-hmm. of Pennsylvania. Shout out to uh, Lackawanna. Lackawanna County. Yes. Why not? If I'm going to shout anybody out in this episode, it's Lackawanna. Um, Ohio State, Penn State. Everything I read tells me those are the top two classes in the Big Ten. How far is the gap between, let's say, Penn State and the next closest? I mean, it, it, it's pretty substantial. Penn State really uh, got a lot of names, both from in-state. and They also did a nice job grabbing some kids from out of state. Uh, but it, it's sizable. The, the next best class is you know, most likely Michigan State. And then after that, you can kind of debate really like Nebraska or, or Wisconsin. Uh, Michigan, not really in the discussion because they only signed 14 kids. Uh, at least as of this recording, which is on uh, what Wednesday night now. So uh, it, it, it's basically, you know, one, two, three, pretty big gap. Penn state got a giant offensive tackle who they sorely need. Obviously everybody here has watched Penn state and their struggles along the offensive line. Two big ones. One who's immediately ready. The JC guy who is, I, I think is the one from Lackawanna um, Paris Palmer is about six, eight. So should lock down a side and be an immediate impact guy. Defensively, obviously, Penn State has very little questions on that side of the ball, but they do lose a good amount. They, they bring in a couple of really good corners who should solidify things because guess what? Ohio State still exists and you need good corners and everybody good on defense to play against an offense that good. So uh, there is good news for Penn State and, you know, the huge news as for Penn State recruiting, no matter how good their signing day was, was always going to be on whatever day it was that all of their recruiting sanctions got removed. That's so, right. They are, they're going to be back much sooner. I know USC fans are probably furious about how quickly all of the weird nonsensical sanctions were removed for Penn state. Um, but uh, Penn state, it'll be, you know, if it's not 2015, they will be full strength just before you know it. And, and we'll have the talent to compete. I mean, look with a, with a really down roster this year in terms of depth, they just about beat the national champion. So I, I'm not terribly worried if they can figure out the offensive line and can build a little bit of depth along the skill positions on offense. Dan, is there anyone in this Ohio State class that's playing right away? Because they bring a lot back as well. Uh, according to my sources, he's sitting next to me. Um, Justin Hilliard on special teams could be quite special just because he's as as good and fierce. He's not enormous. He's only about six feet tall, probably about 5'11", but he's he's relatively local in Cincinnati. Should contribute on special teams. He's a linebacker that's that's very, very talented. But yeah, Torrance Gibson, Bud can speak more to him. Um, he's one of those guys that's just too athletic and too just skilled in general to keep off of the field. He was looked at as a quarterback for a majority of the process, but with what Ohio state has on the roster, it's fair to assume that he's going to assume a bit of a Jalen Marshall role. So high school quarterback who comes in and is just too good with the ball in his hands, to keep off the field. So whether that's situational as like a slot back, whether that's in the return game, uh, Torrance Gibson is going to be really, really good. And uh, Luke Zimmerman of uh, land grant, Holy land shout out land grant. Um, also told us Ohio state, if, if they have a spot on offense or defense, where not just special teams where a guy can, can, uh, can make contribute. It might actually be defensive end. And, and so Draymond Jones out of, out of uh, San Ignatius there in Cleveland. And then also perhaps Sean Cornell, although in my opinion, I think he's a little more of an inside guy than an outside guy. If either of those guys can help on the edge, uh, that could be a boon to the Ohio state defense. Was it disappointing to look at the other classes in the big 10 outside Ohio state, Penn state, Michigan State, and then whoever you would consider third or fourth or fifth? You know, not, not really, because I, th- I think if you look at, at the, the the guys that you would expect to to you know kind of pick up the slack would be, what, Michigan. And, and Jim Harbaugh got in, and he was at a, a pretty significant disadvantage in terms of, of prospects having been turned off uh, to Michigan for, for quite a while, because it was pretty obvious that Brady Hoke uh, was not going to make it. They were losing commitments left and right over the last year, and he could have had a class that was r- rated higher, but it would have meant, I think, reaching for a lower level prospect just to fill numbers and, and, and looking at how they, they closed, I think they closed fairly well. Michigan still has a lot, has a lot of, uh, of name recognition value with, with recruits. Jim Harbaugh actually did a really nice job today on Saturday day, going down to Delray beach Atlantic and grabbing Shelton Johnson away uh, from Florida state and Miami for, to get a defensive end prospect. Very impressively done there. And I think Michigan is, is going to be the team. You have to look at who, who are the recruiting blue bloods who can reasonably take that step and, and become 
a, a great recruiter again. It, it's it's Michigan, and if you put Michigan up there with Penn State and Ohio State, then if Michigan State and Wisconsin and Nebraska are, are your four, five, six in some order, then the conference looks pretty good. But you need those those main three to be recruiting at that high level. And I will say this, Ty, Michigan State and Wisconsin, the two recent powers in the conference before Ohio, Ohio State returned to their glory under Urban, they've never like brought in 15 blue chip guys. They're, the name of their game is always going to be development, is always going to be guys that they feel like are coachable, can physically and mentally develop into successful, you know, four and five star college football players, not four and five star college football recruits. So um, they find their guys. And in the case of Nebraska and Wisconsin, you're talking also about new coaches who had a little bit more time than Jim Harbaugh, but still Mike Riley and Paul Christ come in, they figure out who they can keep, who they can convince is good for the systems that they're going to run. And they try to, to just maintain and start building relationships for 2016. So yeah, Michigan state's got a great running back coming in. Wisconsin has a tight end. I think they like, like a lot, but it, it, it's a case of a lot of these guys are going to red shirt. They're going to, you know, try them out at a couple of different positions. Maybe these guys that are tweeners, tight end, defensive end types. And uh, they more, more will be successful than not. But in terms of guys that are immediately ready to contribute to 10, 11 win teams. Yeah. Perhaps you're not going to see that at Wisconsin, Nebraska, Illinois, Indiana, Northwestern, whatever. But uh, you know, I think the same could also be said for Minnesota who now year in and year out with Jerry kill, like, well, they're probably gonna win eight games and they're going to do it with two and three star guys who have time to develop. Let's stay in the Midwest and then we'll move on. Notre Dame will close out with my beloved Next. Irish. They had needs at defensive back, wide receiver, outside linebacker. They went west to get some receiving help. They went south to Florida to get some others. They went east to get Brandon Wimbush from New Jersey. But did they address those three key needs? No, I feel like they did a pretty good job uh, of addressing those needs. Wimbush, you have to remember, this was a good quarterback year. But the, the majority of the top quarterbacks were, were, were west of the Mississippi River, for the most part in the eastern region, which is primarily where, where Notre Dame recruits. They go out to California um, some, but but they're mostly an, an East Coast recruiting team. The, the, the pickings for quarterbacks this year on the East Coast were, were very poor, uh, especially with not a lot of depth. So when they lost Blake Barnett, they did, they did an excellent job of going to get Wimbush, who in my opinion has the biggest arm in this class. I, I was watching him throw the ball, and I was just thinking, man, how— how are these high school kids consistently catching this stuff? It, it's, it, it's got to be tough. Um, they, they did a pretty good job w w with addressing the needs. Sean Crawford is a guy who we were talking to Jamie earlier on on the signing day show, and he said, "Hey, if he's six foot, he's probably a five star." And I would have to agree with that. I mean, it's a corner, top fifteen, top twenty in the country, really athletic, great change of direction. They get Dexter Williams at running back at, at, out of West Orange, a guy who's extremely explosive. Devon Coney's a linebacker I'm pretty familiar with out of Palm Beach Gardens. Um, not the greatest range, but a real thumper and, and a guy who can stop the run. Like with it in an offensive line, keeping Jerry Tillery and not having him go to LSU and getting him enrolled early was a big deal. Notre Dame didn't close all that hard today, but they already had a pretty nice class lined up. And I think Notre Dame, along with maybe a team like UCLA and a few others, is a school that's going to need to, to probably show more wins on the field to take that next recruiting step to where they're signing maybe top five classes as opposed to like top 15, top 10 types. Ty, I, I have something to add. Please. A school like Notre Dame in recruiting is an interesting thing because, as you and I both know, you don't just repeat Music City Bowls. <laughs> you just don't do that. So there's added pressure. You're a dick. <laughs> you yeah. really are. No, Notre Dame actually, uh, they they pulled uh, Alize Jones. To did Bud mention him? Um, the, 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 the top tight end or one of the top tight ends in the country. And if there's anything that is irrefutable about Notre Dame's recent history, especially with Brian Kelly, tight end after tight end. Yeah, they went, they end. stole a guy from UCLA, right? Yes. Out, out of, uh, out of Las Vegas, same school as Snoop Dogg's, uh, at Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas. So that, that should be very encouraging because the tight ends that Notre Dame develops are not always coming in as four or five star dudes. Sure. And now they're bringing in a guy who's as naturally talented at that position as, uh, as really anybody is. All right. Well, we've got one more sponsor this evening, and then we'll talk about some of your questions here in the time we have remaining. Let's talk some naturebox.com, Dan. Mm. Great snack. Terrible nickname. Today was hectic for you. Yeah. Did you find that it was hard to make the best snacking choices? You know what? This is a completely true story. One million percent true. 
Bud and I both snacked on uh, on some Nature Box snacks today. He had some dried pineapple. Rings. Okay, they're great. It's a main our office. The Vox Media office is a Nature Box client, uh, and couldn't be happier. I had some poppy seed sticks. They were great. Hit the spot. So do what Dan and Bud do. Yes. Get delicious and healthy snack options over at naturebox.com. Over 100 nutritionist approved snacks. They've got something for everyone. They've got zero artificial flavoring, colors, sweeteners, yeah. no yeah. grams of trans fat. None of that high fructose corn syrup either. You can find all the bold flavors you crave without any artificial nonsense in them. So if you want to be like Dan, if you want to be like Bud and who doesn't, we equally crave bold flavors or bud flavors, as it were. How about some sriracha roasted cashews? Had them last week, right before I left for Arizona. Unbelievably good. Or pistachio power clusters. All in on the power clusters. Or Big Island pineapple. Uh, yeah, we had the we had the whole the the pineapple stuff today. Um, power clusters, I would say, great snack, great nickname. That's my buddy Brian, but we call him Power Cluster. There you go. If you want to give uh, Nature Box a try. You can get a free trial box featuring five of Nature Box's most popular snacks. Free snacks if you head on out to naturebox.com slash verbal. One more time, that is naturebox.com slash verbal. Yeah. If you are going to snack, at least be smart about it. Go to naturebox.com one more time slash verbal. Get a free trial box of delicious snacks, Dan. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. All right. Uh, do we have questions today? Yeah, let's go through. First of all, I have some breaking news, Ty. Breaking news. Boop, 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 boop. I have accepted the linebacking coach position with the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> that is that is going to be me. So uh, can you still ooh. podcast? Uh, I can. Uh, we're going to pipe in some noise during the podcast. I hope that's okay with you. Right. Because as a Falcons employee, I'm obligated. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, Bud has stayed committed to, and we're all committed to nature box, no matter what our position. Right. Um, no, let's lightning round some questions for Bud and let's be on our merry way. Let's do that. Um, okay, here we go. So these came in from some excellent Facebook people and like three who are less than excellent. I'll let you guess who's who. Um, do, 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 do. What is what is your favorite name for a recruit this year? We talk. He asked. This is from Sanders. He asked about Clemson's class. Uh, but what is your favorite name, Bud? What do you got? Oh, I think it's got to be Shackery Wilson, uh, <laughs> the, the receiver who committed to Georgia. It's, it's like a nice combination of Shack and Zachary. Um, yeah. And so it, it's it's uh, that's a pretty good one. Um, we're also seeing a lot of influence of sort of some some 90s hip-hop names uh you know more tupacs the, the number one corner nickname was biggie um so it, it, it's a really interesting time for names i would like an official request for a standardized spelling of the name deandre um <laughs> because i think we found four different spellings for it this year and as someone who has to write a lot of recruiting articles i would just like to be able to not look up how to spell deandre okay i like the name gladimir a defensive lineman who's heading to virginia I feel a good relatable name from Tennessee's class is Shy Tuttle because there aren't Shy a lot Tuttle's of guys nice. out there who haven't had a little too much to drink and experienced the Shy Tuttle. The Shy Tuttle <laughs> is uh, there's nothing to be ashamed about if you've got a Shy Tuttle. It happens to everybody. Now, Ty, are, are, are you not going to put in Equinamus St. Brown as, as your entry for as another name? Fan? I would love to. I can't say it. I see it. It's in front of me. I don't know how to, it's Equinamus. Ty can barely say the word y'all. Yeah, that's right. I said on ESPN. I, I never got an official pronunciation on that. Okay. Equinamus, we'll call him. Yes. yes. Sure. That's yes, a good one. Yes, we will. We several different languages, by the way. Do I also see that there's someone here uh, named Austrian Robinson? Yes. I mean, that's that's very obvious, but that he's seems like worldly, a... worldly, so of course he's going to Old Miss. Next question. Um, this is from John McGee, who wants to sort of... He, he wants an explanation for oversigning and how... You know, Ohio State this year has 27 recruits in their class. And, you know, Alabama, Tennessee had, you know, has had like 33 players in previous classes. And explain what coaches do to sort of make to, to magically turn numbers into smaller numbers when it comes to recruiting classes. Sure. It's a little bit difficult to do this uh, in, in audio format. It's, it, it, something written is probably better with, with some charts and whatnot. But essentially, uh, you can sign a certain number of guys and you have to get down to the 85 limit uh, with the 85 scholarship limit before the year. And there's a limit of 25 guys. You can allot to each uh, officially allot 
to each class. But there are some rules that allow you to count back guys. If, if maybe one year you only t- you only sign 23, well, 25 minus 23 is two. So maybe perhaps the next year you, you could sign 27 if you early enrolled two and, and back counted them. You can quickly see how this kind of gets into something that's difficult to explain in an audio format. Uh, but then you also have the issue of having to force guys out. And, and there's sort of an, an inherent pride factor in that, you know, you may tell a kid, hey, um, you're never going to play here at name the Southern school here uh, for the most part. And uh, maybe we'll help you transfer out to a school where you can get some playing time. And you know, for the most part, a kid's not going to come out in the media and say, hey, this school kicked me out or, or forced, forced me to transfer because there's, there's an issue of pride with these young men who have almost always been the best player on their team growing up. Um, you also have medical qualifications where you tell a guy, hey, I, I, don't, I don't think you're ever really going to be able to come back to 100% from this injury. They get to stay in school. You get to keep your scholarship. It does go on. Um, but I, I don't think it goes on perhaps quite to the extent that, that some fans on social media would complain about it. And I also think social media has given the schools, or not the schools, but the kids rather, and their old high school coaches and their parents, a little more leverage and, and sort of policing how the schools go about doing this. Because if you really do a kid wrong now, previously, you might get written up in a newspaper, right? And that would look bad, but people will forget about it. On social media now, with how things go viral, uh, your potential for a negative PR hit if you treat a student athlete really bad uh, is exponentially more than it was just several years ago. I, I think that has helped to, uh, to curtail a little bit. All right. Uh, let's go with the final question here. And this one's always interesting because there are a lot of big names here. Uh, Jonathan asks about which true freshman quarterback could be very good or redshirt freshman. Uh, we've discussed the redshirt freshman around the country before. Um, there, there are a number of guys who could, who could step in and, and have big impacts from last year's class. But um, as for as for the true freshman that could immediately step in and we've seen some success with true freshmen, surely a year to sort of relax and look at the playbook and physically mature is advantageous. But Josh Rosen, who we've talked about at UCLA with the opening left by Brett Hundley is certainly a name. Blake Barnett will certainly compete at Alabama with the loss of Blake Sims. DeAndre Francois is somebody that at least has the arm that he he can fire balls in. And uh, it's, you know, that that's an opening to pay attention to at Florida State. I don't know how talented he is as compared to the other options that Florida State has. Bud can speak to that in a minute. Um, I, I'm not crazy about the quarterback situation in Washington. So Jake Browning comes in pro ready with decent enough size uh, going to uh, to Montlake. Zach Gentry at Michigan will be competing with a number of guys. Shane Morris, who I don't feel like there are that many people who feel like he's a lock to take over talented, but certainly not a lock. Uh, he'll be competing with Alex Malzone, two pro style guys, Zach Gentry uh, certainly has the size at about six, seven two thirty. sort of reminds me with that size of Ryan Mallett going to Michigan. Um, beyond that, I think it, it, you're sort of scraping and you know, these are the guys that will only really get chances. By the way, do you know who uh, is finally a college football player? Ty who's that? David Sills yeah, of, of like the guy who committed to Lane Kiffin in USC when he was 13 years old, where'd he go? He went to, he went to West Virginia. He's, he's a top 20. He's like a high three-star quarterback. He's not like the sure thing. Five-star that people thought he was going to be, but he is finally not a 13 year old USC quarterback. Wow. I forgot about him. Right. Uh, yeah. And he's from, I want to say, yeah, it looks like Delaware, Maryland, Delaware. So really didn't have the, the level of competition to, to really show off if he was or not, but yes, he, he is finally a college player. Um, and as, and I just named a bunch of pro style guys. Cause you know, perhaps those are the guys that are typically a little bit more ready, but uh, as for the dual threat guys going to schools that could take advantage, Jarrett Stidham, we talked about earlier going over to Baylor. Um, Travis Waller will certainly be in the competition at Oregon for their quarterback opening. Um, I don't know. You, the further you go down this list, I, I can't see a lot of guys, guys stepping in. Uh, a lot of returning quarterbacks and Kyler Murray is probably the surest thing to red shirt behind Kyle Allen. I got a question. What do you have? Let, let's, let's go to you. you. You can get priority. I've just got a fun question. Oh yeah. For let's Bud Elliott. Fun. You spent yeah. the whole day with Dan Rubenstein. Did you notice any nervous ticks, any kind of uh, broadcasting um, tendencies, anything you saw in working in close quarters with him for a full day? Uh, you, you can kind of he's very good at, at the subtle um, like head nod to the to the production booth on the right. If we're not getting a graphic up like exactly when, when we want it. And, and it's good because he's not like turning his head and giving like the WTF shoulder shrug. Yeah, Cause those guys are really good. But he's just like like a quick little head twitch and he's good. And then, and then he's also really good at something I'm not here because I don't do a lot of TV work at, at 
sort of alternating between looking at the camera and looking at me. And I'm just thinking, okay, are they cueing it in the ear or, or what's going on? But, it, but they're not. So I think it's probably just some maybe a natural professionalism. Did you give them any of the rocket fuel coffee, Dan? No, we did. We did caffeinate between shows. And you can see at the beginning of the second show that we're both like, we need to calm down. There's too much <laughs> caffeine in our veins. And we, were, we were drinking a lot of water at the beginning, which probably didn't help much. But no, we didn't go over to Blue Bottle and get some rocket fuel. All right. Did you miss me? Of course I missed you. Yes. How could I not miss you? I missed you too, baby. I've had I've had two thirds of a beer. No offense to, you know, Brandon to Huffman Ryan. and Ryan. You had Nen. Ryan. You had Caitlin. What did I was I was uh, skimming the uh, what's it called the the show that you did with I think it was with Ryan and Mama H. Oh yeah. Um, Brandon and I Mama did, H. Oh, it was Brandon and Mama H. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's why because I was skimming the Ryan show for the Mama H. And I haven't I haven't listened to it yet. So yeah. whoa. What did she talk about, and did she call me out? All I saw was stuff about socks and that people were urging you to buy her socks, which makes it seem like you're abusing your own dear mother. We had a spirited discussion about Bombas socks because Bombas mm-hmm. was a uh, title sponsor for that show. By the way, I'm wearing my black Bombas. I know you, so am I, yeah. you are too. Sock twins. Um, but uh, Mama H bought a bunch of Bombas socks using our solid verbal promo code right. for Christmas for some mm-hmm. of the other members of the family. Right. She herself does not have a pair of the Bomba socks. And so I just kindly told her you should buy yourself a pair. Mm -hmm. And that prompted the negative feedback that, well, you should buy your mom a pair of socks. And that was so rude. And, you know, I'm just uh, I'm a good son otherwise. But apparently people didn't take nicely to that. Okay, another follow up thought. So I ran into a number of of verballers, uh, I guess. Yeah. Media verballers. Bud was one today. Um, who were very enthusiastic about disagreeing with you about fondue. See, now here's where I stand on this, though. The guy who asked the question yeah. is going with my idea. Oh, that doesn't that doesn't make the idea any better. A lot of people take bad advice. And also, let me let me throw something else out here. What you didn't you did not win this debate. You didn't win this debate because oh, I definitely did. the people who wrote in and had an opinion on the matter they all were either saying yay or nay to fondue, but no one was officially endorsing your idea. Oh, there was a ton of people endorsing. You're out of your mind. I'll, I'm going to send you some proof. I would like to see that. I, I feel like like Ty's position is almost just advocating an, an investment in a very seldom used kitchen appliance that also requires effort both in making and cleaning up. Like I don't, It's very that really, easy to clean, bud. It's very I easy will, to clean. And I will say, too, for a romantic liaison, everybody, like both parties partaking in a, a heavy amount of cheese. Yeah. I don't know if that's the best direction to go in physiologically. Well, you just need some wine with it. You can't drink water. You got to drink wine, something that helps the cheese digest. Well, even still, Ty, you're dealing with a lot of, you know, a lot of heavy dairy environments. This just is true. This No, heavy, you're, you're right. You're right. I, heavy I, I, dairy before physical romantic activity is... To me, is I don't know. That's that's a recipe for disaster. If we're talking about recipes here, I'm just saying, put on the candles, dim the lights. A little fondue doesn't have to be the cheese, right? It's it's an appliance you can use and reuse. And the question was for something economical. So you buy something you can use and reuse, get many other romantic evenings out of. Mm-hmm. That seems to me to be a better idea. Fond don't, Ty. <laughs> Fond don't. <laughs> there are only two types of people in this world. Did Mama H have fondue thoughts? Because I, you, all I had heard from you was that she was like shot out of a cannon and had a lot to say or something. Oh, about she something. called me at work. What? Saying what? She called me at work and wanted to talk for a half hour about fondue. What about it? She liked my, you're going to be stunned when I tell you this, but she liked my idea more. All right. That's, that's mad. She's a little I- biased, but. She, no. she called me at work to discuss this. First of all, I would argue that I am more likable on this show than you are. So <laughs> there is there's no reason for her to be biased as it relates to true. things we talked this about. This is very true. Show. I can't argue that. So we're coming on about two months pre uh, premarital situation. Prenuptials, yeah. Prenup. What yeah. are we talking about? Prenup. Well, first of all, there's my first <laughs> question. <laughs> no. Is she going after that Hildenbrand fortune? Are you going after that fiance Kate fortune? I am not uh, legally allowed to discuss the term, Whoa, terms of our nuptials yes nor a no i can neither Very confirm nor deny Whoa, intrigue but that's not what i'm asking i just want a general status update where your brain is at right now what the planning status is so what's the distribution of labor uh in, in the planning of wedding in, in, in ty's wedding here are you like what 25 75 what, what, what how's it going down 
Um, I have uh, I've been told I've been more active than most. Okay, nice. 60, I, I know we had, to, we had to reschedule a show because you had a cake taste. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, I, 60 40 would probably be very generous, but to say that it's 65 35 is probably a little bit more accurate. That's fair. So what what have what have been the the past two weeks like for you? What have been the the recent activities? We've uh, recently booked transportation. So if you're staying okay. at the hotel, I couldn't work it so that the venue for the reception was the same as the hotel. This is a uh, this is a what's it called? This is a a day wedding, a, a day, day ceremony, a day ceremony. Right. Uh, I've recently booked the transportation for the hotel guests so that they don't have to take a cab or drive themselves over to the reception. So the shuttle right. bus. I've recently booked that, uh, put the finishing touches on the invites last night. So those okay. should be, uh, in our possession relatively soon. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise just trying to make sure that, uh, you know, some of the other odds and ends go off without a hitch, the cake thing. That was a big step. So we're, we're progressing well, but there's definitely a moment. And that occurred to me about mm, two weeks ago where I realized that I must go through with this at this point. Like, mm. even if I have second thoughts, which I don't, I must well, go through got, with we this. We got a question about that, whether or not fiance Kate, um, if there was any chance of her flipping. Flipping commitments, yeah. committing to you. I mean, no a great chance. question on signing day. Can no, I ask I'd, you this? Yeah, please. Does she ever get hit on by oh, people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And do you get told about it? I don't need to be told about it. It happens when I'm with her. No, What? what is the visit policy? The visit policy. Well, a lot of coaches have a policy that you once you commit, you can't take visits anymore. No, I don't. I don't think there are, are necessarily official sure. visit invitations right. out there. Right. But um, where does she get hit on? Any? Oh, it doesn't matter. Like supermarket, just anywhere, wherever. anywhere. A lot of wandering glances, a lot of smiles, a lot of people talking awkwardly. Yeah, it happens all the time. You and Brady, man. Yeah, Living well, that life. You know. Just got to have uh, booming self-confidence, Dan. That's are you a it. traditionally jealous person? Uh, no, I don't get jealous. Oh. I'm not a jealous did person. Did you ever in your youth? No, no, no. Oh, I definitely did. No, I'm not much for a, the jealous Me type. Me Nick Jonas. I'm a team player. By the way, did you drop a Nick Jonas reference there? Absolutely. Isn't his song Jealous? It has been a long day for you, son. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, when are we doing another show? Next Wednesday. Because I've built up. I've amassed a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, all right, next Wednesday, we'll figure something out, probably do a Q&A show. We'll do something. We're going to have some fun with college football and life. So here's the schedule, boys and girls. By the way, drop me a breaking news sound. Breaking news! Boop, 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 boop. In the time it took to just probably discuss the back end of that conversation about wedding planning. Yeah. A story has broken about Jimbo Fisher and Bud has already researched and written and published a piece about it. Yeah. <laughs> that piece is literally about a possible piece. Jimbo Fisher considering hair plugs is officially a thing. Wow. And now it's on Twitter. It's on SB Nation. It's on Tomahawk Nation. We're going to have to invite Bud back to talk about just what it's been like over the last couple seasons covering Jameis Winston. Sometime I, this I want summer. Life advice from Bud too. That that will be an interesting discussion because Bud yeah. Elliott's always an interesting cat. Yep. Bud Elliott, thank you for stopping by. Enjoyed it, Ty. We'll have to talk to him again at some point in the near future. Dan, as we uh, as we mentioned, going to be going every Wednesday or at the very least once a week from here on out through the off season. Clearly, not as much stuff to talk about college football wise throughout the off season, but our plan is to go once a week. We do have the Verbies coming up, which I believe we'll try to do at the end of this month. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who will be down in Texas for South by Southwest. Oh, yeah. We'll be joined by our friend Andy Staples and perhaps a mystery guest to do mm. a live show at their SX Sports exhibit. We'll send out more details about that as it uh, comes closer for those of you who will be down in Texas. May I tease something? Please. So you remember how you did the Bauer Hour? You side hustled? Yes. All right. Well, I've got I've got a side hustle brewing. Uh oh. And it sort of relates to the solid verbal. Uh oh. Myself, our our dear dear friend Ryan Nanny of SB Nation, and our collectively our dear dear friend Dr. Jane ah. of SB Nation and Vox Media, side hustle podcast. Yeah. Is going to be piloted in the next week or two. Wow. I'm just saying, 
It was one of our most listened to summer podcasts. The feedback was outstanding. Um, so we're going to be doing doing a side hustle, and it uh, it's going to be fun. So here's what we do, Dan. Yeah. This is what all the big shows do now. Yeah, we already have a huge presence on this show. Yes, and since do. there's already nothing to talk about in the off season, right. we can make one of our episodes one of your episodes. So the solid verbal presents dot, dot, dot. Oh, shoot. Yeah. See where I'm going with this? Crossover. Yeah, that's right. I like it. All for right. That's all I have to say for today. For that guy over there, Mr. Dan Rubenstein, and of course, our good friend Bud Elliott from SBNation.com and TomahawkNation.com. For our sponsors, NatureBox and Squarespace, and for myself, Ty Hildenbrandt, here in good old Eastern Pennsylvania. Thanks again for tuning into the show. Catch you all next week. In the meantime, stay solid. Peace.